apartment. I check my phone. Um, the, the, this deal closes and I'm like now having two, 2.2 million in my bank account. And, and I just lose it in a, not in a good way. And I get this like feeling, I'm feeling really anxious. I'm feeling totally dissociated from my body. I have this mm. image of like I'm falling into space and like just falling, falling, never landing anywhere, just like falling into nothingness. And that just like totally pulls the rug out of my feet because now I don't have to do anything for resources. Mm. Like I don't have to if I don't want to. And I couldn't, like, I remember next day, I couldn't get out of bed. Like, I was working on this new business. I couldn't work, like, I just couldn't lift my finger. I was like, it's like I was all weighing a thousand pounds. All of a sudden, I just couldn't move my body. And I just didn't know what the fuck was going on. Leo, what's up, man? Or I hey. guess I should actually say Mo now. That's right. That's right. Ha have, have you gotten used to being addressed that way yeah it's a it's a real joy I like i really like when people call me mo it's kind of it's like this like oh i came up with that and people call me by that name versus people calling me by the name that my mom gave me which i never liked so much so it's it gives me a sense of agency and i feel quite empowered with that you know in some ways it is somewhat metaphorical with the consciousness journey where we we basically inherit a set of programming and identities and concepts and all these things that we didn't choose and eventually yet yet we think we chose them we think we're free we think all these things yet um it's actually kind of not necessarily aligned with our deepest essence and uh, it takes some t some unlayering to step into that, and so it's it's very cool that uh, you're doing that with your name. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I've kind of been around this loop, this similar thought loop, where I, I'm also not going to get rid of this <laughs> conditioning. You know, that's still a part of me, um, and I want to hold that as like you know, I, I think I can, I'm susceptible to this like self-improvement to like i'm a new person now and this person i was before doesn't exist anymore i feel like i've been burnt with this story so many times that i'm slowly learning to like maybe this is gonna stay with me and i can still make changes so i'm kind of trying to hold both of these yeah, that's nice. cool yeah i think there's sometimes there can be a tendency on this journey of kind of trying to abandon or run from all the parts yeah. of our lives versus just making space for them in a, in a more encompassing paradigm. And so I definitely, I definitely hear what you're saying. I think it would be cool to just maybe start this conversation by me reading a little bit of an article that I found on your website, which I'll link below in the show notes called looking good versus feeling good my true story about success. And so you were living in New York City in a 2,000 square foot apartment, floor to ceiling windows, in the best shape of your life. You had a few million bucks in the bank. You were sleeping with gorgeous women, which I have also experienced the interesting New York dating dynamic. And at the moment you were, this picture was taken, that will show for the folks on YouTube. Um, you just received an acquisition offer for your company, to, new company to be acquired for 7 million bucks. Yet you write, at this point, whether you can see it or believe it, I'm more unhappy than I've ever been in my life, but I just didn't know it. That's some powerful shit, man. And I applaud your courage and my question for you, as someone who seemingly kind of had it all going on for you, what was the moment where you started to become aware that, hey, maybe, maybe something's off here? Yeah. So I remember this moment. I'm back in New York. 
and I'm leaving Buffer, the company I'd started before. And I'm in this beef with my co-founder. I'm like, you know, fuck you, dude. Like, you, you know, you're not building a, the big enough company that I want to build. Like, you know, I, I want, I want to go public. I want this to be a billion dollar business. He is kind of happy with it, making tens of millions a year. I'm like, no, it needs to be at least a hundred, and we need to go public. So I'm like adamant about that. I'm like, okay, actually, great journey. It was like considering that business a failure. I'm going to leave and I'm going to start the billion dollar business that I really want to build. Um, and, and so, so just to set the stage, this is the thought frame I'm in. Right. Um, how old were you at this time, by the way? Um, 25. Okay. So 26, 26. Yeah. 26. I love it. I love it. Yeah. So I'm 26 and so I leave this business and I'm like, well, let me just get a little bit of cash as I'm kind of building this next true empire, right? So let me buy, sell some of my shares there, you know, it doesn't really matter too much anyway. So I sell like $2 million worth of stock. And so I'm like, okay, I'm now I can just kind of fully go into this next chapter, right? Um, and I remember this moment, like I'm in my apartment, I check my phone, um, the, the, this deal closes and I'm like now having like two, 2.2 million in my bank account. And, and I just lose it in a, not in a good way. <laughs> and I get this like feeling, I'm feeling really anxious. I'm feeling totally dissociated from my body. I have this mm. image of like I'm falling into space and like we're just falling, falling, never landing anywhere, just like falling into nothingness. Um, and yeah, basically I was this money meant that I didn't need to work anymore off of actually a friend of mine who I'm collaborating with right now. He has this blog called Mr. Money Mustache. Um, he writes about early retirement stuff. Um, and he, he gave me this idea. So like, if you can live off of 4% of, you know, the net worth that you have, you don't need to work anymore because you can make that back in the stock market. So with two point two million, you know, it's like, oh, can I live off of 80K a year? It's like, yeah, I can, I can do that. Right. And, and that just like totally pulls the rug out of my feet because now I don't have to do anything for resources. Mm. Like I don't have to, if I didn't want to. And I couldn't, like, I remember next day I couldn't get out of bed. Like I was working on this new business. I couldn't work. Like I just couldn't lift my finger. I was like, it's like I was all weighing a thousand pounds all of a sudden I just couldn't move my body and I just didn't know what the fuck was going on. Like, I'm, I'm, yeah, that was, that's the context of that story. What was the calculus and maybe sequence of events that led you to go to a Buddhist monastery? It seems like that happened shortly after. That's really off the back of that. So like for me, I was living this paradigm of, you know, I want to build this great business, have enough, make, make lots of money, have a cool company, build a cool product. All of a sudden that doesn't matter anymore. Like, you know, that's whether I make more money or less, it doesn't make a difference. You know, I've, I've got enough resources to feed myself until I die. Um, and so I don't know how to look at life anymore. Like if that's taken care of, if my material resources are taken care of, how do I orient myself to life? You know, if that's not what I'm striving for, what the fuck do I do? Right. And I, I just had no answer and I didn't have the sense I could talk to anyone about this, you know, living in New York, I felt like everyone was in that frame of mind. They accumulating resources so they can, you know, live their life. And 
it's kind of like I've accumulated and, you know, it's like I have a big shed full of food that will never run out until I die. I don't need to keep engaging in the fishing or in the whatever, you know, moose hunting that everyone else is doing to accumulate resources. Um, I'm watch, I've watched a lot of the show alone recently, so really, I'm full in this I love analogy. that show. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm funny. like, man, I would love to see if I could last a day. It seems it's, it's awesome. Yeah. So I, I, I can like this, like analogy from, from this very primitive way of life. And I, I didn't know what to turn to. I didn't know about my emotions. I just never, I couldn't even sense my body much. It was just living in my mind, like kind of like living out ideas from my head. And I hadn't heard of therapy. I didn't like, I just had very little connection to my inner world. And the one thing I had done is this guy, Thich Nhat Hanh, he has, um, he's a Buddhist monk who's written a bunch of books and built a bunch of centers. And I always liked his writing. It was very like non, non culty it's approachable. Non yeah. Very approachable, like learning how to meditate and be you know, in your feet and with your breath and simple stuff. And so in upstate New York, they had one of this, these monasteries. And um, I went there a few for a few weekend retreats. And in this moment, I was like, just totally lost. And I was like, I didn't even know what to do or where to go. But I can maybe, <laughs> maybe hang out there for a bit for a little bit just to see what comes next and feel safe. And and have this hope that like, okay, some of the monks and nuns there might know what's happening to me that was so hard for other people to grasp or have compassion for. Um, cause most people are like, bro, you've made it, you know, like great. Right. You know, that like, like, Oh, I feel so bad for you, Mr. Millionaire. Exactly. Exactly. And, um, um, and yeah, so that's when I ended up there and I could, even now telling you, I'm like noticing when I arrived in the monastery, it's like my whole body kind of oh, relaxed. You know, it's like I didn't need to keep proving myself in the way that I had before. Yeah. What a gift. <clears throat> that, that, that feeling, that felt sense of yeah. uh, worthiness. What was the monastery experience like? What was your day like? Yeah, we'd wake up at 5.30, go to morning meditation at 6. Um, then there was an hour of yoga afterwards. Then it was silent breakfast. Um, and then there usually was a lecture about some Buddhist theme, like like impermanence or... You know, like one of the monks or nuns would give a talk. Um, then there would be another hour of walking meditation through the woods. So this was like nestled in the Catskills in upstate New York. And it's very beautiful. And um, I was mostly there in the fall and the winter um, when I arrived. Um, it was fall and winter. So it's just nice to walk through these like, you know, snow and, and fall trees and get in touch with your steps and notice all the chatter in your mind. And they'd sing songs. So like the, one of the ways they distinguish themselves from the more harsher Buddhist lineages is that they're kind of friendlier, more approachable, like you said. So sing some songs and do a lot of crying and well, use a bunch more meditation in the afternoon. And, um, yeah, that's kind of the, the day. Did People in your life around you, what, how did they respond to this? It's one thing to go on a meditation retreat. It's another thing to, I think you would live there for two years, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I lived there. I lived in this first monastery for about seven months. And then I moved to a different center. I lived there again for about seven months. And then I lived nearby for another few months. So this journey was about two years. Um, it was hard, man. Um, I feel sad telling you about it. Yeah, it is. My mom really struggled to understand me. I mean, this is the story of my life, but in that, it's like, I was like, hey, I need, mom, I need some space. I need to go there. And 
And my mom was all like, oh, what's happening to you? Are you depressed? Like, or, you know, you know, and not in a compassionate way, but almost like in a shaming Something's way. wrong way. Yeah, yeah, something's wrong with me. Yeah. yeah, so she had these weird, remember my mom was like, are you abandoning the family? It's like, I'm going, I'm going to monastery to like be with my shit. Like, and I think it just brought up a bunch of her shit. Um, but it was hard, man. It was hard. Um, also went through a breakup at the time. Also, like at a partner, it's like hard for me to communicate to her what was going on. Um, so it was tough. I didn't like the monastery was great because I did feel like they had a level of understanding and compassion for me. Um, and and my my environment didn't really um <laughs> oh one funny story so i remember i remember turning down this offer of like i just built this this next business i wanted to build i just had a, made a powerpoint presentation so and the you know, investor friend of mine was like yeah i'll just pay you five million bucks like just for this so you can come work here and i just sent him an email it's like now i'm going to a monastery and i'm trashing my project um and so there is some lightness in there too. I like I like kind of telling that part of the story. There's also some lightness of like, oh, I'm just doing this, and it's like actually a lot of people think it's crazy, and I'm having you know also a good time doing it. So it's like this juxtaposition of a lot of sadness and pain and and terror, and also this lightness of like stepping out of a very pressureful life and into something that's you know looking at trees and sitting in silence for a bunch of the day. As I reflect on you recounting kind of what a typical day looks like, I have to imagine there was a, a richness in the simplicity of just kind of that s schedule of just showing up. It's like, I think about what it was like to go to high school where I didn't need to figure everything out and I just showed up and... <laughs> was a participant in the, e the the ease of that. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of ease for sure. It's a lot of ease. A lot of community, you know, like no matter what state I was in, there's people around me and that's generally made me feel a little bit better. Um, and I think that's not something I've experienced before where, you know, I'd wake up in my own bed and not be with people or maybe be with a partner or maybe see a friend later, but, um, so that really shifted things for me that like, okay, every day I wake up, I'm in a certain state and I'm, people are going to see me in that state. And there was something very grounding in, in that aspect for sure. It was also hard, you know, it's like, I kind of think of it as like, um, you know, these like old school exercise bikes that have like resistance. So you pedal on them. And even when you stop, it keeps going for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of felt like that was me. So even though I was no longer in New York, I was no longer living that life. My mind was, you know, the, 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 was that was still going. So as I was on these like beautiful trails, all this undigested stuff and experience that I had just been like pressuring myself over the years with was just kind of coming to the surface and now keeping spinning, spinning me out and wanting to be, wanting to get my attention, wanting to get processed. And that was challenging because it didn't have a lot of tools to begin with. And all of a sudden there was all this space and all these things were coming up. And so it was serene and challenging at the same time. Yeah. I think a lot of people that, maybe have been running the kind of default overachiever success program. You know, they think about doing something like you did. They think about what if I just said, fuck it. And just like went and became a monk for a year or two or something like that. What having actually had that lived experience and also acknowledging, obviously everyone's experience is unique. What would you say to those people about what one might, how one might benefit or what one could expect? Um, 
Hmm. Can you ask the question differently? Or I kind of not? Uh, yeah, that? I guess I just think a lot of people are like kind of slightly interested in maybe doing something like this. Right. And they aren't really clear. They don't have the courage to do it, mm -hmm. but they know that there's some type of benefit, mm -hmm. right? That they, they would benefit from this. Mm -hmm. And I guess at the end of those two years for you, if someone stopped you and said, then you were Leo, hey, Leo, I'm thinking about going and living in a monastery for a year. What can I, should I do it? What can I expect? What would you say? I'd say expect a lot of pain, like a huge amount of fucking pain. I remember especially <laughs> the most distinct thoughts as I was there. I was like, no one is going to do this. No one in the world is going to do this. Um, Cause it's so fucking painful. Right. Like you basically leave yourself defenseless and you let all the shit come up that I've become so good at suppressing through various ways of like living a busy, a busy life. So pain, yeah, is, is the big thing to expect. And it's a good pain. It's the good kind of pain. It's the kind of pain that wants to move through you and leave you. It's not like I'm sick kind of pain. Well, I'm kind of sick, but it's a, I'm like, I'm sick and needing to feel this. So I feel better afterwards kind of pain. Um, and I, I find in my journey is I don't really, um, it, the pain of not doing that needs to be greater. <laughs> that makes sense so my pain of keeping on living a life disconnected from myself was becoming greater than my fear of experiencing all this pent-up shit um and um and i, I worked as a coach with ceos that were kind of in transition time um for the for some years since then, after I, after I left the monastery. And I found that that is not something I can do. I cannot give people courage. I can just be there for them once they've made that decision for themselves in the way that, you know, the monks and the nuns were there for me, you know, when I've already made that decision to go there, but they weren't encouraging me to, to go there. I mean, on weekend retreats, they might say like, yeah, come stay with us, but it's, it's a different kind of encouragement. It's not like, a, you know, it's like, it's a choice that ultimately I needed to make for myself. Um, and I think everyone else has to. And I find that that's, it's not, it's, it's a choice that doesn't, that isn't really a choice at the end of the day where you've just noticed, okay, you know, I don't want to evade this any longer and I'm going to go for it. And, what that looks like if most people won't go to a monastery, right? Like, but whether you end up working with a coach or go to therapy or go to a retreat or whatever way you choose to build some self connection is valuable, I find. So I do generally encourage people to do that and to go for that. And what that means for someone listening to this specifically, um, you know, it depends on their circumstance and, and a degree of suffering <laughs> and uh yeah when did you decide to start to work with entrepreneurs and people in similar circumstances as a coach yeah so as i was in the monastery i also started to do a lot of therapy and i did a very specific kind of therapy called somatic experiencing which is a body-based psychotherapy modality um originating from helping people with like intense PTSD trauma and like learning to notice their body, helping reduce that. And, and that's helped me a lot deal with my past traumas. And so I, I, I worked and learned in this modality and I had all this experience of meditating with, with, with the monks and nuns in the monastery. Um, 
and I, I basically felt this sense after the two years were over, I was like feeling quite cleansed in some ways and quite open and having a desire to contribute some of the things I've learned. Um, and then for another couple of years, I did this training where I also trained in this um, trauma therapy modality, somatic experiencing. And I did a bunch of other trainings and, and kind of like learning how to hold space and be with people. Um, and originally didn't start working with entrepreneurs. I was just thinking I would work with people with this, with specific traumas and the sexual abuse trauma, and like things that, that this modality specializes in. And then very quickly, you know, people from the tech world came to me, you know, they were like, Hey, you know, this is what I loved about the people said, it's like a lot of entrepreneurs came to me that said, Hey, I feel a sense of trust that you both have some of the skills to help me navigate my own transition and have the trust that you actually know what I might've been through before as an entrepreneur. And I've, I've had people tell me that, you know, they feel like a sense of difficulty to go to a regular therapist because they don't feel the sense that they understand, or even a regular coach that hasn't been through the shit of like, you know, typical Silicon Valley, raising money, business employees kind of experience, which is a certain level of intensity. They want to have the trust that the other person has some, has witnessed in some shape or form. Um, and so people were just naturally coming to me. I didn't actually for the, at first seek, seek them out specifically um, and just really then enjoyed the work and then began to be like, of course, <laughs> Of course, these people will enjoy coming to me, right? And I enjoy being with them and, and working with them. So it became this natural, natural transition. Yeah. I read the article that you wrote about working with 101 entrepreneurs, which I got a lot. I mean, it's just kind of amazing that that has ended up, the number ended up being that when you decided to write the article. Um, but there was a couple of kind of highlights here and the lessons learned that I thought were very intriguing and compelling. The first one is this distinguishment between detachment and non-attachment. Can you talk about a little bit about what you mean by that? Yeah. Well, I, I would say like in, in most of us, like now it's 2023, it's not 2010. Right. So it's 2023. Most of us have had some exposure to some form of spirituality or therapy or self care. It's kind of very popular and in Instagram and you get a lot of therapists and people like posting all kinds of stuff about this theme. And one of the ways that I've certainly been falling victim to when I started my journey was this kind of spiritualizing or therapizing away some parts of my experience, which is kind of a form of dissociation where specifically when, you know, someone's really pissed me off, right? Um, then in some spiritual circles, and that was to some extent true in the monastery, the, the answer is like, oh, it's like, it's not you, right? And, and like, you kind of want to like, remove yourself from the situation and kind of get all spiritual about it, right? Um, and I think that's the misunderstanding, right? That's the, that's the type of attachment that's, I think, fake or dissociating. Um, and what I think is more truthful is to be in witnessing of your experience. And, and what that looks like is that you know, if you and I have a beef, Scott, let I go, I'm fucking angry at you, Scott, right? The way you talked to me the other day, I'm tense. My, my, my chest is tense. I'm actually now not attached to that experience, right? I'm just reporting to you what I'm thinking in my mm. head and what I'm experiencing in my body. And I'm still experiencing it, right? It's like I'm heated. Like I notice my forearms get tight and I'm like, I want to growl and my, 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 my jaw gets tense. Ah, oh, and now I'm relaxing, right? So I'm witnessing myself without attaching to that being me while going through the experience. So you don't get off the hook. You, you're not getting, you can't take yourself off the hook for not having the experience. It's just when you build a little bit of space 
between the what's happening in your body and your ability to witness what's happening in your body and in your mind. And and when I work with people and and in my daily life as well, that's the importance of what's what does it mean to um, be non-attached while still being with your experience. Yeah, I think there's, you know, for me, what comes up is just like observing the experience, but not identifying with it. Right. You know, it's like you're watching a movie, but you're, yeah. but you're, but you're watching the movie. You're not closing your eyes. Right. And you're watching the movie and you're feeling the movie in your body, right? Like that's oh, yeah. even more uncomfortable for me most of the time. Yeah. One of the other things that you put in the article that I, I frankly can't recall exactly what it, uh, what it was, but I wrote down, um, successful people's biggest fear. And I think it had something to do with kind of losing, like stepping in and fully experience, like potentially like risking, like all that they have gained, um, in the name of, of, of feeling alive. And I, I think that's just a really interesting theme. And I'd love to hear more about more about that. And sorry if I'm butchering it, but I think it was something like that. Yeah. Well, what I can tell you from my life is the way this shows up for me is, you know, when I started my business, I was 20. I had no money. Um, and I had dropped out of college. So it felt very easy for me to have a go, you know, just to try and do something cool. The stakes felt pretty low. Of course, there's an opportunity cost. It's like, oh, should I get a good career somewhere? Like, so the stakes were in zero and yet they felt somewhat lower to me. Um, and then when Buffer was somewhat taking off, we were making money, we were like having people working there. We were like, you know, I, you know, eventually I had some of that money in my own pocket, you know, when I sold some of my stock. It for a while it became more difficult for me to to do something cool again, because now I felt like I could lose all of that, right? And then um um and the stakes had been raised. So I had I had learned to accumulate resources, but I hadn't had the capacity to learn to actually take the risk with those accumulated resources again. If that makes sense. Is that yes, definitely. Sense? Yeah. And and that's a whole process in itself, which I've spent a lot of time working on and, and like, you know, especially working with founders when they're like, and and the pla the 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 cliche statement is like, what got you here won't get you there, right? Like that's another way to phrase right. it. But what that means, practically speaking, is that even though you're now the successful people in your eyes or in someone else's eyes, in order for you to actually practice getting there, um, you need to allow to be this like fearful beginner again, right? That's now taking a risk, maybe an even bigger risk, to like reinvent yourself or to keep growing. And to reinvigorate that ability, once you've gotten somewhat comfortable and successful and you've gotten some good feedback from the world around you, um, I found that challenging, right? To be like, oh fuck, I'm still this dude. Got all this shit from my mom when I was growing up that I didn't resolve. Um, and I don't know what to do with my life. And like, yet there's all these articles written about me um that where i like present myself like having my shit together so like that's the that's the kind of risk taking that gets that i've learned to also grow with like you know the risk that the potential to take on fear which which becomes courage in my body is is kind of also growing you know well <clears throat> recently it seems like you've taken on some risk with your newest adventure in starting a ranch and or, or buying a ranch and starting a community. Maybe as a 
background for that, I would ask, we can start with what, what motivated you to do that? Yeah, just, just, just really two things. Um, so living in the monastery was my first communal living experience. Um, and that was profound. And like, I remember after a few weeks, I was like, that's how I'm meant to live. I'm meant to live with a tribe, you know, with like a bunch of people around me and, and have a different person I can go to for different things and have different kinds of relationships. That's not like a nuclear family, which is how I grew up in Austria. And something really clicked for me there. It's like, I just, it just felt so different. There was just such a different level of experience for me there. And the, the second thing was that, and that took me a long, and I said this to you in the intro a little bit, it's like, it took me a long time to f surface that this communal way of living is actually what brought me the most joy from being a buffer, being from running this business. Um, the way that my, my co-founder at the time, Joel and I, we, you know, we would start, we would like travel the world, we'd hire a few people and then they would travel the world with us. We were basically a nomadic tribe, <laughs> you know, that wasn't herding goats, but was herding like social media posting. <laughs> <laughs> social media, exactly. We were herding not into social media posts. Um, <laughs> and, and it took me a long time to realize what I'd lost when I left left the business that actually the community is, was one of the biggest things I'd lost, but it was always lopsided because it was always a business, right? They always had a different agenda, which is what I wanted to shift. So I recently bought this ranch here called Wildlife Ranch. It's a horse ranch in Arvada. It's near Denver in Colorado. And I'm excited to just create this kind of rich community of people here that you know, have their own gifts and crafts and, you know, our farmers and horse ranchers and, you know, sheep herders, whatever they might be, or body workers or online workers. He doesn't, I don't really have too much of a idea what they need to be, but have this desire, all of them to live in community and to engage in this communal process and engage in conflict resolution, engage in communal decision-making and, and basically provide support to each other by being, by becoming the person we want to become even more deeply. Um, yeah, that's what I'm excited about now. It's a lot of words. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that sounds amazing. And, and I guess, uh, you know, what do you think a living setup like that will offer you and or potentially members because i because i have a lot of friends that are thinking similar ideas right like kind of like moving into a big place with all your friends and what are the experiences that you think might emanate from that type of environment that otherwise are difficult to get yeah well the biggest thing that comes to mind for me is i like i like being seen and witnessed in my humanity by others. Um, that's like a really core desire that, that makes me feel happy. And in, in life, I generally need to put in a lot of energy to make that happen in like the way we live, where I have my house, you have your house. So in order for me to be fully witnessed in community, I need to go to all these different places, you know, I might go to meet up there. I might have coffee with you then. And all these experiences give me a sense of like, I'm being witnessed by you and I'm witnessing you in whatever it is that you do, whether we play volleyball or whether we garden or whether, you know, we talk right now about our life experiences, um, as entrepreneurs and humans and I want to kind of return, this is a little bit of a hippie idea. I want to return to this more original tribal setup where that was kind of right there nearby you, right? And when I say be witnessed by others, it's very different to be witnessed by a one-year-old than to be witnessed by an 80-year-old person, right? And 
And that is all um, kind of, I think, nutrition for me. And, and it's kind of like you want to have a balanced diet. You want to have a balanced mm. uh, diet in, in witnessing of other humans that kind of keeps my body in shape, right? And it's kind of like, <laughs> I don't keep playing with this analogy, right? Well, it's like building a home gym. Actually, I like the nutrition analogy better. Let's, let's, let's with go that. with it. Let's go with it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm desiring like to live here with 30 to 50 people over the next several years. And I want to grow slowly of all shapes and sizes and, 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 and skin colors and, and, you know, orientations of all kind, and then engage in this witnessing process, which is, I guess, a fancy word for hanging out. And, um, and my experience is that if I do that, I get really, I, I don't want to use the word happy, but it gets really fulfilling in a, in a, in a, you know, I get all the nutrients that I actually need in, from a human, from a human connection perspective, right? So human connection is the same as food. It's kind of, we need all, we need micronutrients and macronutrients, you know, it's like, it's, it's like. You know, you need touch and you need certain words and you need certain things to do physically together with people. And, and I'm picturing that that happening here would be really, really wonderful. And, and, you know, we'll fight with each other and we'll love each other and what kind of going through all these cycles is, is very healthy and nutritious as a, as a, for a human body, you know, for my body. Well, you know, I, I, I'm. First off, never apologize around me for hippie ideas because I think the hippies had a lot, right? <laughs> In fact, I have a buddy who's got a VC firm that's literal thesis is to just invest in things that hippies did because they were kind of early in their cool. awareness around fulfilling ways to live. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, I think if you and if you look at the totality of history, the way that we live now is very is very abnormal relative to most of the time that humans have been on this planet. Yeah. You know, we lack, we lack this kind of ritual with others on a regular basis. Yeah. And I, and I even, and, and personally, like many of the institutions that we've relied upon for community, things like church, things like the office, you know, all of these things have just gradually kind of faded into the background. Right. And so I anticipate us seeing more people emerging with new kind of intentional communities like the one that you're aspiring to create. Yeah. And one of the real core elements is that I think this is what I think we're really lacking is, is a practice of courage mm. and a practice of courage in a very practical sense, which is, which happens when you are around people all the time, right? You have to be courageous, especially if you live with like with 30 people for you to not become totally drowned out with your own needs. You have to continually learn how to be courageous and stand up for yourself. Right. And that means this ability to be, open to rejection and primarily open to experiencing fear in your body. So this is one, one of the ideas I want to peddle for the rest of my life, just that like learning to agree to be with fear in your body allows you to be much more connection with others. And the way we've lived life for the sake of comfort is very disconnected and very dissociated and very safe and comfortable, right? Like I'm in my own house. I get, pizza delivered by a guy that I just take it off his hands. I don't ever need to expend a lot of fear to live my life, but the price of that is really poor nutrition in terms of human connection. So the way to get more nutritious in terms of human connection is to accept fear as this normal thing, right? Like any person you ever meet, there's a part of you that's afraid of them, which is really normal because, you know, humans over eons have known to like kill each other and hurt each other and like you know it's just there's always this element of like this could go wrong in every single interaction for me and 
agreeing to that as a practice and keeping learning that that's okay is I think what creates actually more safety and more joy and pleasure for my life. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, um, I buy it. I'll, I'll just say that. Like I was at a, I was playing pickleball the other day and I just noticed like, why am I sucking in my stomach around people? You right. know what I mean? Like, like I was just like kind of unconsciously tightening. Yeah. And, uh, all of a sudden I was like, Whoa, my belly is like, needs to drop. Yeah. Um, and I had a, some, a, an experience yesterday on a podcast with a friend where I had the same thing happen. And I'm like, Holy shit, you know, and I think I um I want to stick with that example, right? Because and even if you notice it right now, if you suck in your belly or if you tense your belly, that's a form of you protecting against something, right? Some experience. It's like a bodily way to like contract. So like we contract when we want to protect, right? Um and for you then to make the decision, I'm gonna let my belly hang loose whatever story is attached to that in your head, you know, probably a bunch of them, that requires you to accept some sensation now in your belly, right? Some queasiness, mm. some fear, something that's now moving down there that makes you more grounded, more connected, but also more afraid. Like that's a sense of vulnerability, right? So you're accepting fear in your body and you probably feel better after, right? After you let your belly hang loose. And you also need to digest all the stories that comes with, right? And like now I'm not protected, right? Like someone could gut me in the, with, a, with a knife into my stomach and I'm not tensing, right? Like maybe it wouldn't help anyways, if, even if you had contracted your stomach. But maybe in other moments, it would, you know, whatever. It, that's a whole different story. It's actually, you're actually safer when you're looser, you know, in, in most life's experiences. But like, yeah, that's kind of what I, what I, why I like your example. It, it's, it's exactly that. Yeah, no question. I, I think, <clears throat> you know, just to be specific, like what emerged for me in that moment was uh, a fear of being awkward. You know, right. it, 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 it's a, it's a recent revelation for me that I have this uh, deep seated imprinting around being awkward, like mm -hmm. feeling like I'm an awkward person that drives all these patterns around filling space and situationally avoiding certain people and things and conversations. And, and, um, yeah, I think, you know, to your, to your point, like I could continue to suffer through that for the rest of my life, or I could learn to be with it and experience more freedom. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that is a more compelling option to me, even if it means like sitting there and going, oh yeah, I feel awkward again, or maybe I am awkward. Like, you know, um, but I, I, you know, it needs to be faced. Yeah. Yeah. I like how you shared that. Yeah. So I personally love, um, mystical experiences and when I read about your name change and a kind of contact or resonance with the prophet Muhammad, I couldn't help but be quite intrigued. So maybe you could share a little bit more about that experience. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I had a period in my life last year where I was meditating a lot. Again, I didn't go to a monastery, I just spent a lot of time in reflection. I felt like, okay, I want to do something else with my life. This was like after rebirthing this community dream. And I was sitting a lot and walking on meditation a lot. And I literally had never read or heard about it before. I mean, I know I knew of the Prophet Muhammad um, as, a, as a name and that he was the, the main guy in the, in the religion of Islam. Um, but that religion is not something that's close to me. And I just had this, felt this sense of kinship as I was meditating. And, and I ended up Googling and just learning how he was meditating in the, in the caves of Ira. Um, I think it's north of Mecca for like, you know, periods of time to get clarity and, um, there was something profound about 
you know, resonating with this experience and, and witnessing my own soul searching and figuring out what I want to do next with my life. Um, and I know that I'm going to name it. It's like, I'm afraid of like some of the projections I'll get from people for sharing more about that. Um, and, and acknowledging, I don't know that much about, about it. And I loved also, I grew up Christian Catholic. So the picture I had of Jesus was of this, like, you know, enlightened being that's, you know, flawless. And, and then I moved into Buddhism and the picture of the Buddha is like even more like literally enlightened, right. And literally flawless and, and, and just perfect. And even I read about the prophet Muhammad is like, that dude was not perfect. Definitely not. Right. Like this guy was. <laughs> wars and like you know having armies and like you know butchering other tribes and like winning battles and there was something grounding for me about that it, it felt mm. more realistic you know it's like he meditates in the in the caves and he talks about god and then he also fights battles and kills and murders people and i'm not trying to take this lightly and i want to add some some shared humanity to the fact that that's what it means to be human, you know, and in some ways that those are all aspects. And it just felt more realistic that like, not that I want to, <laughs> I have no intention of like fighting, fighting battles. And so say, what's going know, on at that ranch? <laughs> right. Exactly. Actually, we are prepared. No, no, it's not. Oh my God. This is no, it's not the direction we're going. Um, but yeah, so, so that's, that's the kind of personal, which has more to do with my healing to come from a tradition in, in Catholicism, probably less with, with the prophet Muhammad. It's more to do with the fact that I grew up with this, like, you know, perfectionism and people pleasing and, and doing things for others, which was just this coercive way to control people, to get them to do what you want by saying you need to do this for the community or whatever bullshit. Um, so it's something like freeing for me to like, you know, it's just, read about him yeah. it's beautiful man it's beautiful i uh i'm intrigued to read more myself um but mo i know you have some stuff to do so i want to give you a quick chance to plug the ranch anything else you're working on man i know there's a lot of people that your story will resonate with and i want to make it easy for them to get in touch with you keep apprised of what you're up to and give you the opportunity to do that yeah, the main purpose of my life is really I'm um, building out the wildlife ranch. Um, so if anyone listening to this is in Colorado or wants to be and wants to come and hang out and just check out wildliferanch.co, um, I have a newsletter. You can stay in the loop as we're uh, building ponds and building houses and having cool gatherings here. Um, yeah, so that's that's really my main thing right now. Yeah. And if I can be supportive in some other form, feel free to you know, message me. You can also message me through that website. Yeah. Awesome. And we'll, we'll link all that. Mo, it's been an epic, man. Thank you for your time. And thank you for everybody for listening. We're grateful for you.